of you have been to the Tenement Museum before? Is anyone? Oh, excellent. Okay, so welcome back. <laughs> and for those of you who haven't, we really welcome you to come. I, uh, what we do in our building at 97 Orchard is we talk about the history of the people who lived there and, and made new lives. And the topic tonight that, that Safe Passage is going to talk about, that we're going to, the panelists are going to um, go into is that of unaccompanied minors, immigrants who are arriving here as children, and what happens to them. And when I looked at the records of 97 Orchard, of course, so many of the people who came over here uh, at the turn of the 20th century were people coming as young teenagers. And I'm just going to show you an image. I'm going to skip through this. Okay, so this is a, a census record from 1900. Um, of 97 Orchard, and it's hard to read from where you are, but you, see, you can see there's a Goldberg, Goldberg family. Jacob Goldberg and Sarah Goldberg are the parents. He has a soda stand, so he's selling seltzer water at a push cart. Um, he's arrived in 1899, and there are five children. And when you look at the, a, the date of arrival of the children, you can see that many of the children came alone, and they came before their parents came. Fanny, who's 20 years old, came in 1892. So she has not seen her parents for seven years before they arrive. And she came over, and she worked. Um, and then in 1898, um, her sister Lena and her brother Harry join her. Um, all of them, Fanny and Lena, are both hat makers. Harry is a peddler. And then in 1899, when the parents come, they bring the youngest children, Louis and Clara. And Louis also goes to work as a tailor. And Clara is the only one to go to school. So in this family, you can see the important role that unaccompanied minors played. They were the ones that came and created a foothold for the parents. And the Goldbergs, this is just one example from the many census roles we have of the people who just lived in one tenement building on the Lower East Side. So this was happening all the time that there were young people coming over, teenagers who came through Ellis Island um, and then found work here and then in many cases sent for their families. And sometimes people were coming who didn't have families to send for and they came over and um, went through Ellis Island and were held um, but they were able to be held and um, charities would come and claim them and, and take care of them. So I wanted to just give a historical perspective to an issue that has become much more complicated today um, and and to joining us to talk about this issue are three wonderful people. I'm going to do the introductions for all of them in the order that they're going to speak, um, and then you'll hear directly from them. Um, Lenny Benson has been teaching and writing in the field of immigration since 1994. She is a professor at New York Law School and serves as the director of the New York Law School Safe Passage Project. The project recruits, trains, and mentors lawyers and student volunteers who are willing to represent immigrant youth and has won state and national awards for its promotion and support of pro bono work. She also teaches a clinic of advanced students who join other Safe Passage volunteers to screen immigrant youth at the New York Immigration Court each month. She serves on several city, state, and national task forces devoted to expand resources for immigrants, especially unaccompanied uh, migrant children. In June of 2013, she published Immigration and Nationality Law, Problems and Strategies. She has served as an expert witness on immigration law topics in administrative, civil, and criminal litigation. Isabel Martinez is an assistant professor in the Department of Latin American and Latino Studies and the director of the Unaccompanied Latin American Minor Project at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the City University of New York. Her teaching and research interests include transnationals, Mexican youth immigration, Mexican borders, and the intersections of race, immigration, and technology. Long involved with issues of educational attainment in Latino communities, her recently completed research examines the transnational familial, labor, and educational experiences of unaccompanied Mexican immigrant youth in New York. She is currently completing her manuscript on these youth titled, Making Transnational Workers from Youth. Miriam Santa Maria is the proud daughter of undocumented Ecuadorians and enjoys traveling back to their home country as often as she can. As a junior at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, she is a double major in political science and Latin American and Latino studies. She is currently working with the Unaccompanied Latin American Minor Project, where she provides social and academic support to child migrants. She is also a transfer peer mentor, where she helps newly transfer students adjust to John Jay. She loves helping others, is very passionate 
passionate about learning new things and meeting new people and enjoys all things related to beauty. So we're excited tonight to hear many beautiful speeches here at um, the Tenement Museum. So the speakers are going to come one by one and speak, and then there'll be a conversation, and then we invite you to also join in the conversation. So please join me in welcoming our speakers. So, hi, I'm Lenny Benson, and I want to thank Annie for inviting me to do this talk, and I'm a huge fan of this museum. This is actually my third visit in the last six months um, where I've been able to share some of what's happening with migrant children. I've talked with the staff, and I've talked informally at other events, and I have to say, this is my favorite event that we're speaking about because today I'm going to have a chance to weave together what we do with the Safe Passage Project, but I'm going to tell you how um, I think family history is destiny because I'm, as I reveal the story, I'm going to turn out that my own family very much experienced uh, some of the same challenges that the youth we assist today. But to contextualize, let's first look at what's happening right now and the number from last fiscal year, so it was October to through September 2014, is uh, 67,000 unaccompanied children apprehended at our border. So we don't have an Ellis Island on the Texas border. We have the Border Patrol, and they take children into custody, and they hold them in detention centers. And many of them are released very, very quickly. But you may have seen the media last summer about using abandoned Air Force bases, schools, hospitals, etc. cetera. Um, children come with smugglers. Children come with other relatives. But if they are not traveling with their natural parent or someone who has legal guardianship over them, they are an unaccompanied alien child. And under current law, they cannot be automatically returned um, unless they're Mexican. And in the last five years, we have returned 72,000 Mexican children. So. Um, the problem is really uh, an enormous workload for the immigration court because every single person, even if they're released into the interior of the country, released to a relative, released to a sponsor, is put into deportation proceedings. And the children are legally eligible to seek different forms of lawful protection, which I'll talk about at the end of my program, but they're not entitled to free counsel. So in response to so many children beginning up since about 2006 have done this work, it wasn't just one child in court, it was 10 children in court, and then 30 children in court, and then 200 children in court. I just am two blocks away from the court. My specialty is immigration law. I'm a friend with an immigration judge. Judge Patricia Rowan invited me to create this project. And so I took my expertise as a professor to train um, students, lawyers, social workers, and my excellent colleagues at John Jay through Professor Martinez and the ULAMPER project. We meet children in a large screening room. We tell them we're there to assist them. We explain we're not the government. And we stand up with them in court getting a continuance so that then we can find active pro bono lawyers, free lawyers, who will represent them. So in 2013, my sister sent me a typed transcript from a cousin, my second cousin, Vita Goldstein, and I really want to thank her for all the help she did uh, for this. It's a transcript of an audio recording of my grandmother telling um, a, her memory of being at Ellis Island. And I knew she had come as a child to Ellis Island, and I had definitely identified with the experience of children coming through Ellis Island but I didn't know the whole story. And reading this transcript, which is a mix of English, Polish, Russian, and Yiddish, and I'm not sure I know all the words, I learned that my grandmother was not a lawful immigrant. Many of us have the impression that everyone coming to the country prior to 1922, you didn't need a passport, you didn't need a visa, you just had to get here. Well, in 1907, Congress was concerned about child labor and concerned about child migration and the burden of unaccompanied children on um, economies and the perception that America's borders were open to children. And so they rewrote the immigration law. They, they added to the barrier that was already there, which would be being a pauper. They um, added the finding that a child who's coming without her parent, mother or father, was banned from the United States. So this is a picture of my grandmother a little bit later. She was born in 1898 in what is today Belarus. 
Um, the village of Sparova was destroyed um, in the war period, but it is today a beautiful nature preserve along a huge lake. And um, with all the research I did for this presentation, I'm definitely going. Um, so when she was nine, she was sent by my great-grandfather, who was called Lewis in English, um, with her 11-year-old brother, Sam, to join the oldest child in the family, whose name was Sarah Walensky Goldstein. And Sarah had come to America when she was 12 and a half. So she was about 20 years old when they were coming to join her, just as you described a minute ago, Annie. They sent their oldest child to get a foothold. She had married that year, and a letter was sent, we're sending Hilda and Sam to you. Now, why were they sending two young children alone so far, crossing Belarus, crossing over to the ocean to cross on a ship for weeks? There were two main factors. One was there had been a, a lot of fever in the region. It's a swampy, malarial area, but there was scarlet fever <coughs> epidemic. But also there had been a pogrom in um, 1905. Uh, it was an Easter uprising program, and there were others throughout the region in 1906, 1907, and later. And a relative who had some money sent money to get Hilda and Sam out of what was then Russia, Belarus today. So um, with this 1907 immigration law change, Congress writes a, you know, a straight line, a black rule, black and white. No child may be admitted to the United States who's not in the company of their father or mother. But people still came. And um, the enforcement mechanism for this law was first the ship companies putting people on steamships were supposed to scrutinize who was boarding the ship and writing the ship's manifest. And second, the inspectors at Ellis Island. If you require there to be a family in the law, people will make a family. So in Hilda, my grandmother's narrative, she says, my father hired an agent, and he was a ganif, that means a thief. He didn't do such a good job, but he was paid money to turn her over to a young man who would pretend to be their father. So what am I discovering in reading this transcript is that my grandmother committed fraud to enter the United States. But she was nine, and her brother was 11. And generally in the U.S. law, we do not consider children capable of volitionally, you know, voluntarily committing fraud. Definitely my great-grandfather hired a smuggler. He paid the passage of the young man to bring Hilda and Sam to the U.S. When they got to the steamship, the Zealand, um, Grandma says, uh, must not have been too bright or their eyesight wasn't too good, but they accepted the 21-year-old uh, father as the father of these children, and they were able to board the ship. And when they got to Ellis Island, the eyes of the inspectors were a little bit brighter, and they could tell this was not a real family. So they separated the young man from Hilda and Sam, and they said, you will not be admitted to the United States. They were allowed, through an agent helping them, to send a telegram to Sarah here in this uh, neighborhood, and they, she was told, come and see if you can arrange to claim the children. So again, the law said no child will be admitted, but the records seem to indicate uh, that children were allowed to contact a parent in the United States, and the parent could come and claim them. Um, these are some images I took from um, the National Park Service. So the first one is of children um, at Ellis Island, and the second one is a little bit later, but it's an example of Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. There were others, but they were charitable organizations that tried to match the children with the adult. So Sarah and did indeed come to Ellis Island, and grandmother describes the dormitories where they slept and they were fed and they were bathed. But the matrons, she said, were very rough, and they spoke to them mostly in German, which they didn't completely understand. Mostly they were told to be quiet, um, and they put them into a large room, and the adults circled them, and the children were supposed to pick out the adult. There was some fear of, of stealing children, or the, the adults might take the wrong child, but they didn't really know uh, Sarah. They'd never met her. She had left for um, the United States before Hilda was even born, and um, Sam wasn't born either. All they had was her engagement photo. 
And finally, one day during this t delayed time when she's held on the island, Sarah arrives wearing the right hat. This is an image of typical women's hats in 1907. And something about her clothing that day and the hat she wore was ex Sarah, uh, Hilda realized that's her sister Sarah. She called out to her and the family was reunited, but not so fast. They had to go before the inspector and show that Sarah not being a mother could indeed afford these children. So there must have been some kind of informal exception to the law where other relatives could claim the children. Sarah was expecting her first child and it was quite vis visible to the inspector or the judge and he said, your husband doesn't make enough money, you're gonna have your own family, these children are going back to Russia. Um, so another day, uh, Hilda and Sam had to stay at Ellis Island while Sarah convinced them to let her go and get other relatives who would come and a distant relative came and posted a bond and it was because of that bond they guaranteed that they would support Hilda and Sam until they were 16 that they were released from Ellis Island and they came to live a few blocks away at Allen and Rivington Street. So the building doesn't exist anymore, but in Hilda's narrative, she called it Castle Garten, um, like ca the original name of Castle Clinton, because there were so many immigrants that lived in the building that that's what they called the entire building. And this is a picture of her a few years later with her two nephews, that's her sister's youngest children, and my aunt, great aunt, Sarah, went on to have two other children, and grandma told me that basically she was able to go to school to about the eighth grade, 13, 14 years old, and then she had to stay at home to take care of her nieces and nephews. Here's a picture of her 10 years later with the Sarah, the mother, and three of the Goldstein children. And another picture much later when she's a young adult woman and all four of the Goldstein children are there. They called her sis. Um, she helped raise them. They were a very close family. They all became very successful. Sadly, they've all passed away now. Um, but it was a happy ending that despite the line in the sand, a family was made. So here's Alan Rivington of 1907 and Alan and Rivington of today, which brings me back to the work I do. This is Safe Passage volunteers standing in line and you'll see there's lawyers there, law students, and even a couple of children. We sometimes have family members or school children who come with us to volunteer at the court. And what we're doing at the court is interviewing the young people who are facing deportation to see if they qualify like Grandma Hilda did for some exception. So we have many forms of relief. This is just the main ones, something called special immigrant juvenile status, which is where you've been abused, neglected, or abandoned. And it's not in your child's best interest to return to the country of origin. Another one is political asylum or religious asylum or asylum for persecution. Protecting victims who've been trafficked or victims of crime. Deferred action, um, you're familiar with it for pe maybe President Obama's plan for people who've been here a long time, but there's also a prosecutorial discretion ability, and then general family reunification. But without a lawyer, none of these things are something the judge can do on her own. Each one of these procedures requires um, the lawyer to go to another agency. And so I like to make all the relief disappear because it's an empty promise of our law unless someone's there to assist the children. This is a picture of some of our staff. We were going every month. My class is still every month and I recruited um, Professor Martinez and her students to assist us. But because of the increasing arriving number of children, we now go every week. And there's a picture of some of the young men who allowed us to use their picture. They now um, have status. It took them an eight year struggle to I'll qualify for their status. They're with Guy Stamper, one of our associate directors. This is a typical picture of a happy child. I do want to acknowledge that's a picture of my daughter because we don't like to use the images of our youth. And this is Hilda, who is very proud of me becoming a lawyer. This is, um, I'm in, I graduated law school in 1983, so a young lawyer with my grandmother. And um, if she's listening, I'm sure she's very proud. So thank you very much, and I'm going to turn the podium over to my colleague, Isabel Martinez.
Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Isabel Martinez, and I'm an assistant professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Um, so before I start, I want to thank the Lower East Side Tenement Museum and Annie and Laura Lee for getting this together and getting us into this room to talk about, um, just as Lenny mentioned, a, an issue that is part of our family history and is now our destiny. Um, and just giving me this wonderful opportunity to talk about my family history and how it relates to my work, and not only with ULAMP, but also my research. Um, so I like to begin all of my talks by saying I am the granddaughter of an unaccompanied Mexican minor. I didn't become aware of this, though, until about 15 years ago, in the summer of 2000, and unbeknownst both to him and to me, one of my paternal uncles, I call him um, Tio Felipe, or Felipe Salazar II, would give me what would become the foundation of my doctoral studies, my professional career, and basically one of the greatest gifts that I've ever been given, which is my family's, uh, my father's family history. So on a hot summer's day at my father's family reunion in South Texas, um, Harlingen, Texas to be exact, if we have anyone here from Texas who knows the, the geography, um, my tío would unveil the result of decades of conversations observations and archival research, a slim, gray, Kinko's-bound volume, the Martinez family history, and much of which I am sharing today is a culmination of this work based on both casual conversations and, he, and events that he would observe over the years he's been married to my aunt, um, as well as more formal oral histories and documents from various churches and courthouses, both in Mexico and in South Texas. So at the heart of this family history is the story of a young girl who's shown as a woman above, who had she encountered such a militarized border as the one that exists today, could have very well been apprehended, detained, and detained while crossing, and placed into the shelters that many of the children that Safe Passage Project and ULAMP serve, um, and they have experienced as well as been placed in removal proceedings. So this woman, Josefa Semeño Luna, or Mama Chepa, as she would become known to over 100 grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and now great-great-grandchildren, um, was born in 1902 to Nemesio Semeño and Maria Refugia Luna, a farm worker and an ama de casa, or a housewife, in a small farming and ranching community in El Molino, Guanajuato, which is not far from a city that's better known, San Felipe, Guanajuato. As the only daughter in a family with six other brothers, Josefa would never attend school, but learn at an early age to become a good woman, to cook and to clean and to become skilled in the ways of the home and learn how to take care of her brothers and her family. By the time she was 12 years old, she caught the eye of her older brother's friend, Baltasar Martinez Castro, 12 years her senior, and by January 1915, as she was approaching her 13th birthday, she would marry in Parroquia San Felipe Apostal, a Catholic church that was built in 1641 and still stands today. The ceremony was, according to her account, a simple, but solemn occasion with only a few family members serving as witnesses. After the ceremony, Baltasar would take her to live in his family's hakal, which is a, a thatched hut, as an adobe style thatched hut with mud that very much exists today. That's not much unlike some of the homes in rural Mexico. And he would, just like today in parts of rural Mexico, work from sunup to sundown in the fields while she would help her sister-in-laws care for their children. After three years, not long after her 15th birthday, she would be blessed with a child of her own, Margarita, the first of 16 children, 14 of whom would survive beyond infancy, including my father, who was the only high school graduate and a Korea War veteran. Ramiro Sermeño Martinez. So by the time that Margarita was born, however, a revolution had already been raging in Mexico. And this, the, we're thinking about 1917 here. So the Mexican Revolution started about 1910, so we're about seven years into the revolution. Los Guarachudos, as they were called by los federales, or the federal soldiers, and they were called Guarachudos was a reference to the Guaraches, or the sandals that they wore on their feet. 
um, had risen up against landowners and were fighting for rights to own land. Los Guarachudos would eventually become organized by Pancho Villa and pose a formidable threat to the Mexican government. <coughs> Although El Molino, where Baltasar and Josefa were, had not yet been a site of violence, rumors of both Villistas and Los Federales were coercing boys and men to join their armies and forcibly taking food, any sort of weapons, ammunitions, as well as horses, and then women and young girls from campesinos had reached and worried both Mama Chepa and Baltasar. With only sticks and brooms to defend against guns, Baltasar and Mama Chepa's brother, Juan, would begin to discuss the possibility of leaving to El Norte. And Juan knew of men, so her older brother already knew of men, who took goats to El Norte to sell. And he knew where they could cross a Rio Bravo, which is the Rio Grande River, but the way the, and on the Mexican side it's referred to. There was a place called Tejas, where, according to Juan, there were gente como aquí, pero no hay revolución. There are people like here, but there is not a revolution. Although Juan would end up, would not end up joining young Josefa and Batasar on their trip north, another family, the Colungas, led by Calixtro y Simona, would agree to embark on this journey with them. So sometime in either October or November of 1918, about seven or eight months after my grandmother reached her 16th birthday, she would wrap Margarita, or el Mago, as they had nicknamed her, in her rebozo or her scarf, hug her parents goodbye, and leave her home. So this is a map of where they were more or less in Molino Juanajuato and the route they would take to the Texas-Mexico border. So over the next two months, Mama Chepa, Baltasar, Mago, Mama Chepa's 11-year-old brother Victoriano and the Colungas would travel over 400 miles by a carreta or a donkey pulled cart finally arriving exhausted to the southern bank of the Rio Bravo River, known in the United States as the Rio Grande River, and they would arrive approximately in January 1919. So it's hard to pinpoint, I had my little laser, but I left it in my bag, um, exactly where they crossed, but we believe that they crossed the Rio Bravo near a point that was originally founded in 1749 as Via de Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe de Reynosa, which is now um, more commonly known as Reynosa Tamaulipas, um, which has also become a very contested violent city in, in, in the um, U.S.-Mexico border region. Um, and they would cross from point A across the line, which is the Rio Bravo River, to point B which is known as Peñitas, Texas. To cross, they would have to ride a chalan, or a hand-pulled ferry across the river from Mexico into Texas. The crossing fee was three cents per adult if no one would help pull the ferry across by rope, two cents if someone did help. All in all, Baltasar would pay five cents to pull his family across into southern Texas. So although the Immigration Act of 1907 required all immigrants arriving into the United States to enter through an official port of entry, submit themselves to inspection, and receive official authorization to enter into the United States, Josefa crossed neither at an official port, nor was she met by the migra, or the inspectors who become known as the Border Patrol, because this was a federal entity that wouldn't be established for five more years in 1924. So instead, young Josefa and her family arrived without encountering the olive green uniform fanfare that currently awaits young children and teenagers today. So arriving on the northern bank of the Rio Grande, they found themselves near a town called Peñita, Texas, which had been founded nearly 400 years earlier by a splinter group of survivors of the Panfilo de Narvaez expedition, a group of Spanish explorers who were priests, five military officers, and their slaves. Instead, what Josefa and Baltasar found was a new group of explorers, a campsite with other families who had crossed in the days and the weeks 
prior to their arrival and who were also escaping Mexico's violence and were in search of a better life. They would rest at this campsite, eventually moving and settling, first near a, a southern Texas town called Mission, Texas, and then Raymondsville, Texas, following work as it was offered to the men. As Josefa approached her 18th birthday, her belly swollen with her second child, a child who became my tío Gregorio, or Goyo for short, and who was also a World War II veteran, they would finally settle on a farm where they would remain for the next 25 years. So arriving in South Texas, I like to think that young Josefa Sermeño Luna was in many ways not much different than the unaccompanied min immigrant miners fleeing Mexico, Central America, and other parts of Latin America that we see today. Although my grandmother was accompanied by her husband, under today's definitions of unaccompanied minor migrants, she would no doubt be subject to deportation, right? She crossed unlawfully without her parents. She had no relatives in the United States to become her legal sponsor. Just like the thousands of children and teenagers who have left their homes in fear for their lives, she too was escaping violence and poverty. And like them, it took all of the courage that my grandmother could muster in her small four foot nine frame to flee to El Norte, unaware of what she and my grandfather would encounter or what would become of them if she would ever see her mother or father or her other siblings again, or even if she would arrive alive. And lastly, like them, she would miss her home. She would miss her mother, her father, and her siblings desperately, but learn to adjust to South Texas. So it was this family story that prompted me to embark on my own research with unaccompanied Mexican minors in New York City around 2006. So I would return home late at night on the subway from Columbia's library, and I would see peach-fuzzed males slouched on the subway seats, seemingly tired from what I thought would be a very long work shift. Um, too young, though, I noticed them because I thought they were too young to be riding the subway at 11, 12 o'clock in the, in the morning. I began to wonder how they arrived, and seeing a hint of my grandmother's story in them, I saw my research as a better way to understand my paternal grandmother's journey to the United States, as well as her settlement as a teenage minor. So, to understand this more recent phenomenon of Mexican youths arriving without their parents, I embarked on this, on this study and I wanted to look at a particular subset of Mexican youths, teenagers who sought to and had immigrated to New York City without their parents to work. So leaving between approximately 2000 and 2009, these minors were born in the years leading up to NAFTA and became teenagers in the Mexican states most negatively impacted by NAFTA, Oaxaca, Puebla, Guerrero, southern Mexican states, where by 2012 in some communities, as the headline states here, um, diez chavita, chavitos migran al día, which basically trans in, translates into 10 young males leave a day, okay? So as young as ages 14, 15, 16, and 17, and most with less than a ninth grade education, my study participants left Mexico after facing considerable economic hardships. Unable to enjoy the prolonged childhoods and adolescences that accompany unfettered access to schooling and absences of economic worries and responsibilities, my study participants at early ages were already taking on roles and tasks oftentimes deemed appropriate for adults. Even before they left their homes, these youths were already seeking ways to support their families and gain higher economic positions for themselves and for their families in their Mexican hometowns. With older siblings, aunts and uncles, and cousins sharing mostly exaggerated stories of endless employment opportunities in New York, as well as seeing the effects of remittances though in their hometowns and the fancy trucks and the big houses, these young people begin to do the math and, and exhibiting significant agency, look, not only start looking north, but start heading north. So, Unlike Josefa, these youths did share heart-stopping accounts of seemingly cat-and-mouse maneuvers with Border Patrol, but unlike the youth that ULAMP serves, which we'll talk about in a minute, these youths arrived mostly 
not apprehended, not detained, and not placed into deportation proceedings. Instead, they were able to arrive in New York City where they found that employers cared very little about their ages or their legal statuses and instead privileged the hard work that usefulness allows them to perform. So almost instantly, these youths begin working on average between 60 and 70 hours a week and earn between 200 as a low and $450 as a high a week, which was on average about $5 an hour, mostly in the backs of New York City's restaurant kitchens. Largely invisible, these youths are unspoken of and left to transition into New York City's undocumented adult population. So I, um, I'm currently completing this manuscript and probably foolishly began to think of a new research project <laughs> before I even finished my first manuscript. And I started thinking about um, the impact of um, unambiguous criminalization on the way that these youths would understand their lives. And so that's what brought me to Lenny and Safe Passage Project. So in thinking about the next um, project, I wanted to understand how the youth who were apprehended, detained, and placed in removal proceedings understood that in their lives. Did they see that as something that was a very adult um, process, or did they still feel like children on top of the going through arriving here and, and emigrating here and going through the journey, the journeys that they did. Um, and so in thinking about this, um, I was brought to Lenny and started thinking about ULAMP, which is the Unaccompanied Latin American Minor Project or the project that I direct, um, and how we could create something that could, could, we could learn a little bit more from these youth, but also benefit Lenny and Safe Passage Project. So I created ULAMP as a research and service project to understand this phenomena, but also to provide academic and social support to recently arrived immigrant minors or newcomers who are presently in deportation proceedings. Working in conjunction with Safe Passage Project, ULAMP interns, who are all CUNY City University of New York students, assist the youth, and I also want to add, they're also either immigrants themselves or children of immigrants, all Spanish speaking, all first generation college goers, um, assist the youth and their family with finding proper educational programs in New York City, including traditional and alternative educational services, as well as social support. So this last year, you Lampers, so there were five core um, interns, they translated for and supported nearly 100 children and teenage migrants, mostly from Central America, who were facing deportation. So before, oh, I missed a lot of stuff here. Um, sorry. So before Miriam discusses what you Lampers did exactly, I want to bring this back around and bring the attention back to the title of my talk, Something Old, Something New. So while I was already conducting research with youth like my grandmother, by shifting my research and service focus to the latest wave of mostly Central American youth who are crossing the U.S.-Mexico border, I also physically brought myself full circle, and I didn't realize this at the time. Um, so while most of my Mexican study participants reported crossing the Sonora-Arizona border, the majority of the youth that we're seeing through ULAMP are crossing through South Texas and more specifically the town where my grandmother crossed, Benitez, Texas, and the surrounding counties of Brooks County, Cameron County, Hidalgo County, and where the numbers of crossings have surpassed Arizona for the first time in over a decade. And so Reynosa, where my grandmother originally crossed, is actually the end of a railway that begins at the southern Mexican Central American border. So what is old is new again, or maybe better stated, what is old never really ended. Okay, so now I want to hand it over to Miriam, who's going to talk a little bit about you, Lamp, and the amazing work that they do. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Miriam Santa Maria, and I am currently a ULAMPer. Um, like Dr. Martinez and Lenny Benson, I am to a relative of unaccompanied minors. Sorry, okay. So just like many of the youths I have worked with in this past year, my cousin, Manuel, arrived to New York City when he was just 16 years old. His mother passed away when he was two years old, and though it is not clear, the family story is his, family, his mother possibly died because of domestic violence. While I did not know this when I began working as a ULAMPer, over time I came to realize my personal connection to this project and to this issue. 
As ULAMPers, our job is to provide social and academic support to child migrants. We attend juvenile court dockets every second Thursday of the month to help translate for attorneys who are conducting screenings of the children and teenagers. We are there to both help the English-speaking attorneys communicate with the Spanish-speaking children and teenagers and vice versa. It is also, we think, a comfort for the child and teenager to have someone who speaks their language and is closer to them in age during this stressful time. After court, we are assigned one to two new clients to call on a weekly basis. In these calls, we encourage the children and teenagers to either enroll in or do well in school, as well as to not become discouraged while Safe Passage Project is finding an attorney for them and to let the children and teenagers know that they are not alone. And they have someone that they can talk to. I'm sorry. <laughs> what I found while working as a ULAMPer is that in spite of their extraordinary circumstances, all they want to do is fit in. They want to do well in school, they like boys, they are arguing with their girlfriends, and they're, then they love participating in plays. These are some of my concerns. These are some of the concerns of my amazing client who I will call Cynthia, a 16-year-old girl from El Salvador. From her case file, I knew that before migrating to the United States, she lived with her aunt. Once in the United States, she reunited with her mother and her younger sister. Cynthia is in the 10th grade and her favorite subject is English. She is so enthusiastic about learning a new language. After speaking with her, I found out so much more. She would proudly talk about her advancements in her ESL classes, receiving 90 and above in almost all of her weekly quizzes. At first, she was shy and our conversations were very brief we would talk about questions that she might have for Safe Passage Project regarding her immigration case. As the weeks passed, she began to tell me more personal stories like her crushes and her high school drama. One afternoon, I called her and she sounded upset. She was trying to make, oh, as we got the conversation rolling, she explained to me that her classmate was picking on her. She was trying to make her life impossible by spreading rumors about her. On top of that, she explained to me that after Cynthia started to curl her hair, her classmate began to curl her hair as well. Cynthia was so upset that this girl was now copying her. This girl had felt envious of Cynthia's hair, and that is why she must have started everything. I mean, why else? I could relate to this because in high school, I have also experienced bullying. I tried to use the example of a mean girl I, ex I experienced in high school to try to advise her to direct her focus elsewhere. I shared this with Cynthia, and because of my own experience, I was able to connect with Cynthia and not only understand her, but give her an advice as well. This brought back so much memories of unnecessary high school drama that I guess everyone has to endure, immigrant or not. Right now, Cynthia has an attorney who believes she qualifies for special immigrant juvenile status and is working hard to keep Cynthia in the United States. In, ad in addition to supporting amazing clients like Cynthia and other ULAMP office work, we do fun things like play soccer with the children and teenagers and have holiday parties and workshops for the kids. For our Christmas holiday party, we made cards, bead necklaces, and bracelets, watched movies, popped popcorn, and distributed clothes. Books and food we collected through various book drives. We also held a safe sex workshop where teenage migrants were educated on safe sex practices like birth control and condoms, as well as sexually transmitted diseases by two Spanish-speaking specialists from Bronx Love Heals. Before this project, I had no idea of my connection to this project or what was in store for me as a child of Ecuadorian immigrants. Now, with the help of the perspective that I have gained through ULAMP, I hope to write my undergraduate thesis on the migration from Ecuador into, United, into New York City, including that of my own family. My mother migrated here in 1984 when she was 19 years old, and my father in 1981 when he was 20 years old. This project has helped me question why everything is happening. When I was younger, I had always wanted to become an immigration attorney, but I never thought the goal ever seemed feasible. 
Working with the Safe Passage Project and ULAMP has made me believe this is possible, as well as even exploring other options. It has given me the confidence that I can achieve and complete anything. I plan on going to graduate school to further study Latin American studies and explore more issues that relate to Latin America or attend law school. Wherever I go, I know that I want to empower immigrants, both children and adults. In our own way, we should find ways to help this population because these children and teenagers are our leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the wonderful presentations, all of you. I think one of the things that's so interesting is the way in which knowing your own family's history has been an empowering process, and that motivates so much of what you do. Um, I wanted to first give you an opportunity to respond to each other, if that is something, you know, a comment that came up that you thought that you'd like to respond to before opening it up to questions. I, I mean, I just wanted to say that I have never been happier as a professor or a lawyer since I started doing this work. And part of it is, um, I think anyone who teaches knows that the great joy comes in helping others grow and learn. And when I listen to Isabel and to Miriam, it just it so much makes me so happy that we all can work together. And um, we are speaking today so happily and cheerfully, but the lives of the children that we're helping uh, we haven't talked about some of the really deep and dark trauma that they've been through. Uh, so that I, I, I wanted to say I'm glad we were able to share the bright side of what we do, but uh, this is also very demanding work and challenging work for us because of the needs of this population of children who are really fleeing. Right. I, mean, I completely agree with Lenny. I've seen, so working with both populations, as I said in, in the talk, I've, I've worked with a population that I don't want to say luck. I don't know who's lucky, unlucky. I think all unlucky because of our, our laws, right, our immigration laws. But I've worked with both youth who do not have access to the legal services that we're providing and luckily, I guess, didn't, didn't um, encounter um, Border Patrol and Homeland Security, but now they're pretty much in limbo. They don't qualify for DACA. Um, some of them would have qualified for SIG had they known about it when they were younger, right? And now uh, working with ULAMP, I am working more with it with the kids who again lucky unlucky I don't know how to how to really describe it but are at least um, receiving services from Safe Passage Project and from ULAMP and so um, it's a very uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in this population um, and and it's very complex and this is a very complex issue I think we can draw from our family histories that you know I know uh, as immigration law has evolved or devolved, if you want to say that, um, it's become increasingly harder for these young people who really are escaping violence and searching for a better life for themselves and their families to, to do that. Right. Um, I would have to agree as well. Um, there is some, I mean, I pointed out Cynthia, which has a very joyful story, but I am working with some clients that don't have as happy uh, stories as you can imagine. Um, I have a 17-year-old boy who wants to be a police officer. He wants to join the military, but um, he, ha he works at a car wash from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. because he has no other option. Um, I just also wanted to say uh, just one more comment, and then we can maybe take comments, questions from the audience, is um, when I began the project in 06, I thought of the children more as children who had been abandoned, neglected, or abused by adults. And so this remedy called Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, which has been in our law since um, about 1990, but wasn't really well known, was where I put the focus. But I think our project is now really also a refugee project because of the endemic uh, violence against the children and the breakdown of civil society. The top three sending countries are Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Those are the top uh, those three countries are in the top five countries for the greatest civil violence in their societies, highest murder rates, rape, extortion, and children are intentional targets. Our law uh, protecting refugees evolves, and while it may have begun with the displaced peoples of Europe and uh, things like political or religious persecution, 
recently um, there has been a greater recognition that children and women who are fleeing domestic violence or lack of protection within their country should indeed qualify for protection as well. And so I just wanted to note that June 20th is the International Day of the Refugee and Safe Passage Project will be hosting a self-guided audio tour walk I'm recording now a historical podcast starting with Castle Clinton um, down in Battery Park, going along the Battery, talking about the different refugee groups who've come through Lower Manhattan and ending at New York Law School. It's about a two-hour walk. Um, and hopefully the audience who's listening will think about joining us on that Saturday afternoon to acknowledge the refugees of the past but recognize that these children are refugees too. If someone would like to comment or question, we invite you to come up and um, we want to make sure your voice is heard and is accessible in the recording. So if you don't mind coming up and then speaking in the microphone up there, that would be wonderful. No one has a question. I can keep talking. <laughs> well, we could have a conversation. Is there other stories? Well, I wondered. Um, because I'm an educator, um, I know there have been some real issues about school districts yes. not encouraging children, not allowing children. I know some of the Long Island districts and other districts in upstate New York okay. have kind of warehouse children and not let them into classes. I wondered if you could address that. You know, Miriam, maybe you could talk about some of the children um, and why they're not always in school, but I'll just answer it legally for a moment. The New York Immigration Court um, covers the entire state. There is also an immigration court in Buffalo, but the majority of the children don't live in that region. And so we have cases that go as far up as the Vermont border, over into the Finger Lakes region, even a little bit further west. And half the children that arrived last year live in Long Island. So in part, I believe it was the federal government's failure to do um, assistance to the adversely affected school districts as they they do have a project of refugee resettlement assistance when there's an impact on a community but because these children are not recognized yet they have to go through the legal process the money is far behind the reality of the children's lives and of course constitutionally in the United States and under our state constitution and our state law children are entitled to go to school so um, Safe Passage and other organizations, lawyers, Latino Justice, the ACLU, particularly the New York chapter, which has an, a branch in Long Island, went to work on advocating for the children and the State Board of Education and the State Attorney General's Office did really step in in a, in a, a bold, clear way to say you have to support these children. But the reality of the children's lives, just as it was in the turn of the century in the 1900s, school may be a luxury for some. So. Miriam, do you want to add about some of the challenges the kids have told you about? Um, of course. Um, so yes, I do speak to some children and they do live out in Long Island. Actually, most of my clients do live in Long Island. Um, some of them would love to attend school. Some of them dream of attending school, but most of them can't. And um, most of them, like I said, with one of the clients, a 17-year-old boy, he works at a car wash from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. We have also a gardener who's 16 years old who works from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day. Um, and he also wants to go to school. He um, actually, with the books from, that we donated from La Casa Azul and the book drive that we held, um, I sent him books so he can um, practice his English because that's the only way he, he can learn. It's by himself. Um, through books, through television. So it's not that they're not trying to learn, it's just that they don't have um, the economic or the finances to do so. It, this reminds me of the, the historical period too where we had working men's circles or we had evening programs, people had to work during the day and there was some educational opportunities at night. Although New York City offers some of those programs, they're very, very um, unavailable in places like Long Island. So this summer when you're visiting the Hamptons and enjoying the beautiful hedges and bushes and fantastic food and manicured lawns, maybe realize that some of that is the invisible workers um, and think about ways to not necessarily be negative but be positive to support those school districts um, so that they can support those children. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of different
different things. So I'm actually consulting on a project that's funded by the Deutsche Bank um, and the Americas Foundation that is addressing the, the Mexican youth. So this goes back to my first study, the Mexican youth who, again, uh, similar to the kids that Miriam was talking about, want to go to school but simply can't. And so I, they're here to support, so in this population, they're here to support their families and they're sending money home. In many cases, they're supporting a their own livelihood here in New York City. They pay upwards $400 in rent to be here. They have their own expenses. They're paying for cell phones. They're acting very much like adults. So um, that you know, to do that and to send money home, that's, they're working the 60 and 70 hours a week, which doesn't leave much time for traditional schooling. And so this project that I work on, we're trying to think about how do we re reimagine schooling for these populations where, you know, they, they have not been children, they have not been dependent on adults for a very long time, and they don't want to go to, into that stage. They want to be semi-independent or independent adults. So how can we provide schooling for them that honors what they want, right, but also allows them to continue with their schooling and get educational uh, credentials? So we've been thinking about ways to reimagine seat time. There are laws around the amount of hours they need to spend in schools, um, looking at online learning as well as um, to remedy this. Um, but I think we need to be also, in addition to training educators in the traditional schools and giving more money into adult education programs to sort of rethink education in general for this population. The online learning seems how they don't have, they're not going to have the resources to do that. I mean, but if they don't have the slightest bit of education, how do they even read the, I mean, how do they even do that? I mean, it's one thing, it's dealing with little children with pictures who have very simple needs and they have probably an adult to show them. What do you do? The, um, last year I was invited to uh, visit a university in Mexico and I'm going to mangle the name of it at Monterrey Tecnologico. Tec de Monterrey. Thank you. It's one of the mm -hmm. largest private universities in Mexico. They've actually been using um, a curriculum of online access and support to try to increase educational achievement within Mexico. But of course, internet access is not always available and that's why it's important to support access in our schools and our libraries and in non-traditional hours. I do wanna say that many of the youth we see from Central America are, and other countries are very high educational achievers. We also have an outreach project that we do pro bono. In other words, there's no source of funding. We work the school in Washington Heights called Wheels. And it's uh, primarily young people from the Dominican Republic, but also from West Africa. And that school, the children start with the assumption they will go to college. Um, sometimes they're going to have to get out of high school and work for several years or work, go to community college to save the money. Um, we've been, in the last two years, able to help more than 50 children obtain status. And one of the young people this last year just got a full scholarship through the President's Opportunity Program to attend a private college in upstate New York completely for free because we were able to help her get status. So I'm working on the mayor's office right now and hopefully the state will do this as well. What comes first? You know, uh, in my view, I'm sorry, it's going to be get them a lawyer. Because if you get the lawyer, the lawyer can get the status. And if you get the status, then you have more opportunity. Um, hello, um, my name is JC. I live uptown in Washington Heights. Um, and um, it's a place where you hear uh, native languages from Guatemala. I've heard it several times. And it's, uh, you see this, this bustling um, immigration happening. And it's wonderful. I'm a child of immigrants from Colombia. I'm an anchor baby. And um, it, it's really great and commendable what you're doing. And I, I really, I came in at the end when you were speaking. And I think it's really important that you're talking to kids about safe sex. You're talking to kids who are coming here, probably 16, 14 year old, you know, young kids who are coming into the fabric of America from another place. And my question is, I'm just wondering how, how wise they are to these issues about sex, sexuality, um, the dangers, uh, the, you know, whatever it is, you know, how, how well, well versed they are in, a, in, a, in an urban American way uh, from where they're coming from. 
And I, I think it's great that you're yeah, doing this. Maybe yeah. Miriam can respond, but I'll just do a I'm little. Go sit down. I'll just do a little legal context. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. And if you speak Spanish and you'd like to volunteer, let's talk. Um, uh, the um, the indigenous people from Guatemala definitely are coming, and more and more often in court, Spanish is not a language that works. Uh, we need people who speak Quiche and other languages like that, and we've been reaching out to people who are volunteering to do um, translation and assistance so that we can match them with lawyers. Um, but I also wanted to say that these three countries don't have universal child education. So these are interrupted learners. Um, very few of the children have had continuous schooling before they make the journey or they, they can't afford school after the age of about 12 or it's completely unsafe for them to go to school. I would say the majority of young women we've interviewed from Honduras, by the time they're 11 or 12, their family decides it's too dangerous to go to school because they will be targeted by um, unsavory elements, whether it's corrupt police or gangs, and so they stay home and they begin to work in the home or they do sewing or they do cooking or they work in a, in a business, but it's not safe to walk the street to go to school. So when they arrive in the United States, maybe a few years later, in the peak of their adolescence development, first I think mentally some of them think of themselves as adults already because they've been emancipated um, from the school life. And second, um, they are unsophisticated about uh, the let's say the mores of um, American society. So one of the things I'm so glad that um, Professor Martinez and her students are able to do to augment the work the lawyers do is to help acculturate the children to educational achievement and safe health practices. And I just have to do one other thank you, which is the city council this year recognized the mental and health needs as well of these children. And so they have given us a grant, so we now have a social worker on staff. So when serious problems arrive or the appropriate education is needed, we have a social worker who can make referrals, help make assessments, and help train all the lawyer and paralegal law clerk staff. Okay. Um. So I, again, I'm going to go back to the Mexican case and a little bit more of that. Um, I mean, one of the things that um, we need to understand too is just uh, the age norms, right? And sort of what the age norms are in the communities that they're coming from, and what are the age norms here? And so what I've seen in a lot of the research that I've done with um, with the youth is they're coming from communities too where they get married at very young ages and they start families at very young ages, and then they arrive here um, where we have, you know. What is it? Um, becoming adulthood is being is being put off more and more and more and more, right? So we're also, I think we have to be very careful and take that into consideration as well, and not just put this American Western framework on the kids, but to understand the communities that they're coming from, the ideas they have about um, appropriate ages, it's beginning families, and work with them in, in that capacity, right? And so that's one of the things that I've seen with my research. Um, and I think that was a very good question. But um, I also see that um, they're not much different, right? Like um, it might be a cultural aspect of it, but um, they, they don't know much different than what I knew um, at that age. So they do um, very well soak up. Maybe if they don't admit it, you can tell that they do soak up the knowledge and they are very appreciative of what, you know, we presented to them. And um, they know that if it wasn't for for the event that we ho that we hosted, they wouldn't have been able to learn about the things that they they did because of cultural aspects and you know. There's another story from my grandmother. Um, she went to a rally Mag Margaret Sanger held here in Lower East Side, and when she came home, her older sister Sarah, who had raised her, was scandalized, slapped her, and said, "You're not going to be a loose woman." And Hilda said, "I want to be a nurse, and I want to learn because every year I see the women in this building have another baby, and when we ask how not to have a baby, the answer is have your husband sleep on the roof." Yeah. You knew that one. Probably the standard medical practice of the time. Uh, I've really appreciated hearing about 
uh, how navigating the legal system works and education in its different forms. And I'm curious about more broadly the social world that um, the teenagers and kids are in kind of once they get um, into the system that they're navigating some kind of a solution. What are, are people mostly with families or are they sort of in a community of other people who are going through the same thing as them? And I just, you said something about, um, or somebody said something about the mental health and, and I'm just thinking about like the emotional experience of, of this and if you could talk a little bit about that and what needs are being met or not met and how. Well, I'll give a few statistics. Uh, first of all, do remember that the children from Mexico, by and large, are pushed back into Mexico. We, same would happen to Canadians if um, a number of Canadian children arrive because of a negotiation we have with that country. And there is a plan in Congress to try to amend the immigration law to make that for the Central American children, too. But because that is not the current state of the law, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act does allow children to make these claims for protection at the border. That means they go into detention. Sometimes detention is seven days. Sometimes it's months. Sometimes it has been years. And the children are affected by that early treatment and detention. So building their trust with us or with when they're released into the community is um, very much affected by the experiences they had when they're held. Second, 55% um, are released to a parent. So is this a family reunification law or is this a refugee law? Most of these parents would not have sent for their children or asked the children to come. Um, many of them have not asked the children to come. They are surprised when the children arrive. Uh, bec unless there were real push factors in the country of origin. However, the children are often coming to reunite with a family. And uh, I saw an image of Enrique's journey earlier. We require all of the people in our program to read that excellent book because there is this honeymoon period of I'm reunified with Mama who left when I was two and we've talked on the phone and I've gotten some letters. But then you're going through adolescence and a new country and a new language and a new school system and you're dealing with Mama who suddenly wants to tell you when to go to bed and what to wear and how to do your hair and uh, what to eat and who are you to tell me what to do? You left me. So there are real um, challenges for these families, not, not everyone, but challenges of reunification. And uh, the other thing I just want to say in terms of law then is that this is another indication of a broken immigration system. So even after we started requiring visas and programs in the past when someone could come, eventually they had a path to regularize their status, whether it was through employer sponsorship, asylum, refugee law, or some kind of family sponsorship, and then they would send for their family. We have had a barrier to that kind of family reunification. Once you've broken the law and you've been here more than a year, you are banned from immigrating even with sponsorship except for asylum um, for 10 years. So are you going to risk and leave and wait at home for 10 years so that you can try to come again? And if you've crossed the border illegally a second time after a period of unlawful presence, you're actually banned for life. So most Americans, when they talk about border control, they say people should get in line. There is no line. In 1996, we cut off the line. There are a few lucky people who qualify for waivers that require you to be married to a U.S. citizen spouse or married to a military spouse, a U.S. citizen military spouse. Um, that is part of the reason some of the children are coming. We've had a broken system, and unlike the families at the turn of the last century, there's no way to reunify. But now going back to maybe what you two have noticed about some of the challenges in the families or their social milieu. Um, so there are the ones who are reuniting with, fam with parents, right? But there are also, just as uh, Lenny alluded to, uh, children who are arriving who, the, the relative, first of all, it's not a parent who's waiting here, and that relative may not know that they were on their way to, to arrive here. So uncles and aunts who, all of a sudden are thrust into this position to become legal sponsors for these kids. And then you see, um, a, you know, conflict there, right? They didn't, um, they may not be able to support them. Um, they put them, they are going to have to support themselves. And I know this has been a situation with several of the youths we've been working with. Um, and also going back to what Lenny said in terms of this, uh, I think this is what you said, mm -hmm. but this idea, I, I keep on coming back to this idea of 
acting as an adult, right? Because this is the focus of my, my manuscript. These kids have lived pretty much on their own, making decisions for themselves for many, many years, and they arrive here and all of a sudden are subject not only to um, their parents' rules or their relatives' rules, but also um, whether or not they are in removal proceedings or not have this uh, legal status that is, they're in limbo, right? And anything can, set, can set, the, set it off and set them back, right? So they're, they're having to act, um, they're being forced to act, they don't have the freedoms that they had when they were back home, right? And so that can cause significant conflicts in the families. And we've seen some of the kids have run away from home <coughs> and um, I'm gonna brag a little bit about our ULAMP team and that one of our ULAMPers was the only person that the runaway was in contact with. They had broken off contact with the relatives. They had broken off contact with, I think, the Attorney of Safe Passage Project. And this particular teenager only trusted one of our team and remained in contact with her throughout this. So we knew that she was safe. We knew where she was. And thankfully, um, we could get the mental health specialist, the social worker from Safe Passage Project, to try to delicately piece this family back together and assist her and convince her to either come back home or to at least be in a safe space and let her family members know where she is. Um, so we're dealing with a whole variety of issues. Um, we also see some children coming in to live with their brothers, their sisters that they've never met before. Um, that, that also causes conflict. Um, they don't feel safe sometimes at home, um, comfortable. But, um, yeah. <laughs> One last question. Um, hello there, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Michael, and I have a question about uh, the process like after it occurs and whether um, the child migrants are having trouble um, adjusting to uh, living here and the transition and everything um, uh, because of what they've gone through with the increased family detention and things like that. And uh, they're kind of concerned that maybe because all of that makes them feel as though they aren't really welcomed or a part of society and they're a part. Um, and if you've seen that, I'm, I'm an immigration attorney who does this regularly. So I was just kind of wondering, since you've looked at it in depth, to kind of see what would happen. Well, I need your card. I need your card as yes, well. Yes, okay. So I don't meet anyone without saying you too can be part of the solution. So I'm looking at the audience. If you speak Spanish, you want to come do the art table at court. If you're a social worker, I see some of you in the audience. Thank you. If you're a lawyer, a law student, if you're a retired lawyer, I will get you involved. Um, we're happy to do it, and the project's really grown. We have now over 400 cooperating attorneys. Um, Megan, your statistics you said was 50 different law schools, so although we're housed at New York Law School, we don't discriminate. Um, so anyway, please get involved. But I think part of the answer is it depends, like with any children, right? I've seen children who go through suicidal ideation, you know what I mean? They threaten themselves, and one young man did say to us, uh, the news on Fox, and I'm naming the network, said we were all going to be deported. Maybe it's better I just end this now than go through what I what I would face at home. Better to be certain. So, you know, happily, uh, the social work team was able to help get him into therapy, and he's doing a lot better. Um, there's also, you know, I can tell you other sad stories of children who the family members do get stressed, they're economically stressed, and they say, I worked when I came. You don't just to just go to school. You have to work too. I understand the courts requiring you to go to school. I know the law requires you to go to school, but you've got to work and you've got to give me so much money for rent. So that's an old story and there are definitely kids like that. But I've also seen remarkably resilient kids and it's not to say they won't manifest some of the stress later, but they're so happy to be reunited with a family or to be in a place where they're not afraid of every day being targeted by gangs. and. They begin to achieve well in school, and when they have hope of status, teachers tell me heads go up, hands go up, more eye contact is made. When one young boy in a study that was recently done said, before I came here, I was just Jose. Now I'm Jose the undocumented immigrant. Um, when Jose can pass that line and just be the teenager, he can be Jose with the cool haircut or Jose with the wrong tennis shoes, but he doesn't have to be labeled by a legal status. So uh, again, a you know, big part of our mission here is to help guide the children through the complex legal process and give them hope throughout.
going to say any more about that. I go on and on. I'm sorry. It's time to go. you to speak even further what are the different ways that people in the audience can help so if you're not a lawyer and you don't know Spanish are there other ways to help these wonderful organizations yes so um, I'm gonna mention June 20th again um, I, I don't know if you liked our history talk today uh, we're gonna be recording an audio talk we'll have it up through our website you can download it for free and do the walk but how much better you could do if you paid $25 for this beautiful audio tour we're doing and maybe got 15 friends 10 friends to walk with you um, join us at the end of that afternoon at at Safe Passage Project, um, raise awareness about the needs of these children. Why is money necessary? Well, again, the federal government doesn't guarantee free counsel, so there's no, quote, federal public defender for children. In any legal process, uh, a child would be in like juvenile delinquency, they'd be appointed counsel, but they're not in immigration court. And so uh, we are a project that helps pro bono lawyers. A year ago, it was, me, a law professor with a full-time job, and two part-time lawyers. Now we're at 10 staff people, and that's been at the generos generosity of some private foundations, the city council, and a very small um, grant from the, from the federal government called Justice AmeriCorps, where young lawyers pledge to work for $19,000 a year um, for one year to assist these children. So we help uh, support those young fellows by giving them a living stipend, paying their subway ticket, helping with their health insurance costs and their rent to get them up to 40, which is a good salary in many ways, but obviously uh, when you have lost debt and so forth, it's very challenging. So you can help us with your financial contribution, but we also need people who are willing to work on education, work on um, volunteering at the court art table. Maybe I can just explain that. The court gives us a very large room where we can screen children, and we don't want them to be fearful of us. So we wear name tags, and we have our lovely younger people helping us, and many Spanish speakers greeting people in the hall. Uh, but by doing the art table, we find that it immediately breaks some ice, mm -hmm. that you know these people with the coloring books and the crayons and the paper, they must be helpful people. Also, it's a, a technique you can use to it, interview someone with drawing, especially a younger child. And I mean, it's just a little thing, but raising, uh, coming to do the art table or being at a soccer match or um, coming and uh, helping us with um, tutoring. I mean, if people wanted to do that, we could probably set up things like that as well because some of the children would really like to improve English and they don't get enough support in their schools. Mm -hmm. Whatever she needs, we say, stay, get it first. And, and again, I think that the legal representation is the most critical piece of this. And so the, the support that we give the kids um, is secondary, I think, to, to what they're doing. Um, but we did um, last year do a book drive with La Casa Sun Bookstore, which is a great Latino literature mm -hmm. hub in East, in East Harlem and Barrio. And we were able to collect over, I think it was 2,000 books and over $5,000, something like that, um, where the books have gone both to children who come to court. They're all in Spanish. Um, and so kids who may be adjusting to the, to the American and the New York City school system can still... Um, as they're learning English, can read books in Spanish um, and have that connection back to their home and to their home language. Um, so we've been distributing the books in the court once a month. Um, I also recently returned from South Texas, so I, I wanted to see for myself as well as to help um, in training our ULAMPers um, see that first point of entries, the detention shelters and the people that they are going to have that first interaction with. And I was able to meet with um, several wonderful people who are doing similar work to Safe Passage Project, Pro Bar, South Texas Asylum, the Children's Project, um, the Young Center for Children's Rights. Um, and so we've also been sending them books because they've relayed to us that they are in desperate need of Spanish language books. I don't, if anyone has been to South Texas, you know it is not the land of, of bookstores and definitely not Spanish language books, bookstores. So we've been sending boxes to them so that they can distribu distribute to the kids at their first point of entry. Um, and so, yes, I think um, that's, yeah. yeah. So if you have Spanish language books, chill age appropriate um, from 
little bitty picture books to maybe teen, we are more than happy to take that to distribute as well. And we take English books as well. Um, we've had some kids get really excited about having their first, you know, young adult fan fiction, you know, and they want to love romance story in English too. Um, you know, this may sound like just a really little thing, but a kid coming from Long Island with an adult sponsor to immigration court and they are required to come to court, the round trip ticket is $54. Mm -hmm. If they're only earning in that family five or six dollars an hour, just think about how expensive mm -hmm. that is, taking a day off work, and they do, and they come to mm -hmm. court. So another thing is you can donate to us for a fund that will mm -hmm. help make sure they can make their court appearances. So we really welcome any kind of donation or support, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry to even have to ask for it, but no, it is yeah, important and we need important. it. Um, Miriam, I was going to say when you in your bio, I was I thought it was very um, charming how you said that you enjoy things of beauty, and I think tonight you were able to see the beauty of your colleagues and your own beauty, and we were able to experience that as well. And the grace and the beauty in the work that all of you are doing, and the Tenement Museum is so proud to have been able to welcome you here, and we encourage you all to go out and continue doing the acts of beauty you're doing to help in um, in this situation. So thank you all. Um, um, for coming tonight, and please join me in thanking.